nowadays, you know, the the freedom to travel and in, in building the company are not necessarily uh, you know part of the same or the same intention. Uh, the you know the freedom to travel is sort of hey, I I like to I like to travel. <laughs> you know, I like to travel. I like to go places. Uh, I like to be in a different environment. Um, and sort of you know I would be almost building the company in spite of traveling. It's, it's mm. to be honest, it's easier to run a, a business and to work when you're not traveling. Hello and welcome to the Working From Home podcast. I'm your host, Nelson Jordan. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Dave Schneider, who's the CEO of Shortlist and is here to talk about being a digital nomad, traveling and earning money um, while you go. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Nelson. No problem at all. I'm, I'm genuinely very excited to, to speak with you. You're somebody who, um, kind of unbeknownst to me, I've been following your career without realizing it. Um, I've been using um, your your previous software company that you helped build up, Ninja Outreach. Um, I didn't know you were the person behind it, so it's it's yeah. really great to meet you. <laughs> cool, I'm uh, glad to hear that. Always good to meet. Uh, yeah, sort of. Well, I hate to say a customer because it's not my business anymore, but yeah, I, I think you know what I mean. <laughs> sure, a previous customer, if not a current one, for sure. Sure, amazing. So. You're uh, currently the CEO of, of Shortlist.io. What what do you guys do? It's a digital marketing agency. Um, although I like to think that we approach things a little bit differently, um, but uh, you know, for lack of a better word, we do offer you know SEO and convert rate optimization and design and dev. So it's definitely an agency in spirit. Perfect. And is that uh, I know obviously you're remote. Is that a fully remote agency, or do you also have a hub? No, it is fully remote. Everything I've ever worked on has always been fully remote. I don't even think I I, I would begin to know how to run a, a non-remote business. Um, and so the majority of the team is in Eastern Europe, um, in places like Macedonia and Serbia and Croatia. Um, you know, and I've worked with people all, all over, whether it's Asia or, or South America. Uh, Ninja Outreach was was much more spread out. Um, but I liked uh, the idea of having uh, a more central centralized remote team. Um, so, okay. I guess, I guess there actually is an office in, in Skopje, Macedonia. I forgot to, uh, I, I, I forgot just because I don't go into the office. That doesn't mean that there isn't a, an office. Um, so I guess in some ways it's, uh, it's, it's sort of pseudo remote. Um, there's an office in Skopje, Macedonia where about 10 or so people, um, meet regularly, you know, in non COVID times. And then the other 10 or so people of, of this 20 person company, um, they're scattered about the area. Mm-hmm. And what's the, what's the reason that, um, that you hire multiple people from the same country? Is there any kind of rhyme or reason behind that? Yeah, I think there is uh, a, a rhyme and, and a reason. You know, with Ninja Outreach, it was, uh, let's just grab, uh, you know, whoever is the best person, you know, that we feel like for the job, kind of independent of, of where they're based and things like that. Um, and obviously, you know, having complete flexibility to choose who um, is going to work at the company is great, but it does create some internal issues um, around time zones, around communication, around culture, things like that. And so with uh, Shortlist, I wanted to try something a little bit different um, than I had done with Ninja Outreach, which is I wanted the company to be remote. Um, I wanted to work with people, you know, uh, abroad, but I wanted there to be somewhat of a, of a, what's the word, I guess, zone in which we kind of operated in. Um, and I felt that this would be better and that people would more or less be working the same hours. There'd be less issues with um, communication barriers, with someone not being on while somebody else was on, language issues, um, and the opportunity like we have now for there to actually be a physical office that people can kind of go in and strategize and work. Um, and I think that overall makes the organization more efficient. Mm-hmm. So all of your employees seem to be kind of in, in a similar area then. I'm quite curious then about the clients that you take on. Do they share those kind of time zones or are they in other parts of the world? 
Not necessarily. I, I think that, you know, many of our clients are in America. Um, that's just kind of where, you know, the market uh, is uh, and where uh, people who are willing to kind of say pay the most money, so to speak, um, are. Although we've serviced clients certainly from Europe and, and Australia and New Zealand, but I think that the majority are, are in the States. Um, the thing is, is that um, while people at shortlist, they need to work together 24-7, um, you know, client interaction is, is, is much less of, of, a, of a need to be, say, 24-7. You might want to have a call with the client once a week. You might want to exchange some emails. Obviously, you're communicating with them, but it's not as important that they're on the same time zone as everybody else. No, I get that completely. Um, a lot of people ask me how, how it is because the majority of my clients for my conversion copywriting business are based in the U S and it's exactly for the reasons that you outlined then it's, you know, it just happens to be where, where the money is and the opportunity is to be quite frank. Um, I I've often found that the same conversation to start to, you know, sign off the same amount of money, here in a company in the UK versus a company in the US. In the US, it gets signed off like that. And then in the UK, there's rounds and rounds of discussions to go through, lots of different stakeholders to manage. And, you know, it, you, you gradually lose momentum and it's a lot harder to get the same amount of money signed off. So I totally get that. The other one, you know, in terms of time zones, which is quite interesting, I, I work with a lot of Australian clients as well for, for a similar reason. And people kind of say, well, how do you manage all of this? And they kind of forget that I'm not talking to clients every single day on calls or anything like that. The majority of, of the work is done, um, you know, is kind of front loaded in terms of the briefing sessions. And then very much they kind of leave me to get on with it and do the research and then present back to them. But the majority of days, even when we do communicate, it's, it's via email, it's via Slack. It's not necessarily like an instantaneous, I have to be there from nine to five their time, which would obviously be pretty late for me here. So I, to I totally get that. And it's, uh, I think a lot of companies nowadays are hiring freelancers, are hiring agencies where, whereas previously they would have hired full-time employees. I think gradually people are, are getting more, um, more kind of accustomed to the fact that not everyone works the same hours with them as, is that something that you've kind of noticed as well? Among the clients and sort of their level of comfort with working with, say, an agency and, and things like that? Well, I, I think just looking generally at uh, the direction that things are going, a lot of businesses are now uh, experimenting with remote work. They're getting used to somebody maybe not being in the office and not seeing them nine to five, as you mentioned, um, or maybe not even living in the same place as them. And so, you know, hypothetically, that, that might lend itself to people being more comfortable with agencies because agencies are always sort of by, by nature a remote team that's sort of working on your behalf. Um, but I can't say anything other than kind of anecdotally that, that it seems like that's the case. Of course. So um, obviously with, with Shortlist, you're, you've built this kind of fully or well, partially remote team, we should say, with the office. Uh, you forgot about the office. I forgot about the office there for a second as well. So we're, we're all friends. Um, tell me about your, your kind of journey up to this point. I'm very conscious that you've, you've traveled extensively. You've built a, and sold a very successful company. Um, you know, how, how did all of that come about? Yeah, it's... Uh... You know, it's been years, uh, and so it's nothing sort of overnight. And um, there wasn't exactly a plan either. Um, it was mainly always just thinking about what was the next thing that we wanted to sort of do. And so when we were, my when well, my girlfriend now she's not my wife. When we were working in Washington D.C., we were thinking, you know, you know, we really want to go travel. Um, and so we started to plan a trip to kind of go backpacking around the world for you know one two years. And said, oh, okay, well, let's start a travel blog because everybody does that. Why not? And then we said, oh, we'd like to make a little money off this travel blog uh, because we were a little short in our savings to cover the full extent of the travel that we wanted to do. Um, so we started saying, okay, well, if we're going to make a little money, we have to learn a little bit about, about digital marketing. We need to learn a little bit about how to grow a website and, and how to uh, travel blogs monetize themselves. And so that got us into SEO and, and doing some client work. 
um, in working basically digitally, uh, remotely, and just getting comfortable with the kind of the ecosystem. Um, and then that kind of carried on for a while. And then uh, one, you know, this is sort of a, I made a hard pivot essentially to, to software, you know, uh, because I had been working on the travel blog for a number of years and I didn't really feel motivated or enthusiastic about, about the work. Um, I didn't feel like uh, inspired necessarily. It wasn't really clear like what the, uh, what the product was, what the service was, who the customers were. Um, seemed kind of like there was, uh, you know, we were one of many, obviously there were so many other travel blogs out there. We were actually making money though. I don't want to confuse it by saying that it wasn't, that wasn't going well. It, it was going totally well, but, um, but I just wasn't feeling uh, the passion for that work. Um, that coupled by the fact that Google started to make some algorithmic changes, which made it more difficult to do, uh, provide some of the services we were working on. Um, and so I started to think about software. Um, and that's why I started Ninja Outreach. Uh, and I met my partner, Mark, and we kind of built the team remotely like I did then. And that, that was about four years or so of, of working on that and developing that product. And then uh, eventually we decided to, for, for personal reasons to sell it. Um, uh, you know, I was moving back to the U.S. I was sort of getting, you know, stopping the traveling life. Uh, felt like I was going to need want to buy property at some point. All these sort of things, all these adult type things started to kind of come come to me at once. And I said, uh, you know, I think, um, think that the, the best thing for me to do is to sell this business and move on. Um, and then eventually I started uh, shortlist because having just sold Ninja Reach um, and not really having an audience or a fallback or kind of much of, of anything, I was like, well, what can I kind of get off the ground, you know, the quickest uh, in a service based agency uh, seemed something like I hadn't tried before and an opportunity to learn more about that business model. Um, and so that's essentially where shortlist kind of came in and that's been two years or so now. Mm. Also, I've interviewed quite a few people now for the podcast and something that comes up time and time again is when managing remote teams, it seems like software as an industry seems to come up really, really frequently. So I had um, Luke Shermer on here, who, who's kind of an expert in that field of, of remote work. And he first started, for example, managing remote teams and telling other people how to do it in, in the software industry. It just keeps coming up and up and up. Is, is there something special about software that makes it so kind of complementary to the remote working lifestyle? Maybe. Uh, I, I, I could think of a couple different potential reasons. Uh, I can't be sure about any of them. I mean, you know, firstly, um, you know, developers are very expensive. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking always from a U.S. perspective, just because I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen. Uh, so forgive me for any listeners who are not uh, in that area. But, um, you know, I think of the U.S. as having very expensive developers. So it's it's somewhat of a, of a natural tendency for us uh, entrepreneurs in the U.S. to look outside uh, for developers in Eastern Europe and elsewhere where the rates are just more, uh, you know, re reasonable for certainly a bootstrap startup, for example. Um, so I think, you know, that, that, and that starts to lend itself towards remote. Secondly, software sort of implies um, an aptitude with technology um, that you're probably used to using tools and, and, and therefore you're more comfortable making the um the transition to remote uh you're used to working with tools like slack and skype and zoom and things like that so i think that's another reason um and then secondly everything just oh, thirdly i guess everything just kind of exists in the cloud and software there's not really like a physical product um so you can kind of already you don't necessarily need to have uh, storage space or it's not as important to have an office or, or things like that so I, I think that there are some some yeah nuances that make software more inclined to be remote. Mm -hmm. I, de I definitely get the feeling that when you have not just the processes and systems that are online, but also the product itself as, as software, obviously, I feel like that lends itself to that, that mindset. It's not necessarily that you can't do it with the other industries. It just seems to be an easier step with software kind of starting that, that sort of company for me. Um, so with your, your, your whole kind of travel experience, when you were managing the, the blog in particular, um, did you have kind of an, any employees then or was it kind of you just um, handling everything yourself? 
Yeah, we worked with uh, virtual assistants. Um, and it's always kind of, you know, what, what does it mean to be an employee? You know, uh, so I, you know, are they contractors, are they employees, are they yeah, the virtual assistants sort of, uh, but I would say comparing then to now, uh, it definitely feels like they were more of a kind of contracted help as opposed to this team. There was not mm-hmm. in a couple travelers organization, there was not um, so much of a, everybody felt that they were, that they belonged to this company and things like that. It's different than it was an Ninja Origin shortlist. It was more that we utilized the various people to sort of help out. Um, most of the work we did ourselves, um, we were only, uh, well, I mean, there wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary to be honest, to have a big team with people providing a lot of different services. Um, but like I said, we would use a little bit of, but we had a developer who helped with the site and, and we had, uh, you know, more like an admin assistant and stuff like that, but it was mm-hmm. small. So how about, um, Ninja outreach? Did that change at all? In terms of the way the team was? Yep. Yeah. It was a huge change. And I don't know why, um, you know, it, it went in that direction. Uh, I mean, that team also eventually was 20 or so people and it was marketers and copywriters and designers and developers. And I, I just think the business just required that fuel to grow. Uh, whereas a couple of travelers just, just wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like a growth oriented business. It was, I don't know, more of like a side hustle. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas Ninja Reach, you know, that was sort of a proper uh, company in, in most, res- most respects. Um, obviously we had a product that we were developing and it just, a lot of pieces need to kind of go into that. So it was very much going headfirst into, you know, building a remote team. Mm-hmm. And had you kind of had that experience of managing people before you did it? Not at that scale. Um, like I said, I had, you know, I had people, I had virtual assistants, for example, or developers or however you want to call it, the contractors that we found on Upwork um, that needed some degree of managing. They needed direction. They needed feedback on their work. They needed, you know, some oversight. Um, but uh, they were rarely asked to work with each other, for example, Um, It was very much, I would be in the middle and then sort of, I was kind of uh, delegating and and overseeing. It was very one-to-one. And so when Ninja Rage kind of came around, uh, I really had to think more about the organization, about how people were going to interact. Eventually, you know, people had to have roles, responsibilities. Uh, They maybe were part of a particular department. Um, It just became much more official. Mm -hmm. Did you have a a roadmap for what you were going to do in terms of these processes or any resources you used? Or was it very much, uh, this is the problem in front of me, I'm going to try my hardest and try and find specific guides on this one and then move to the next one and so on and so forth? Most of it was, you know, hey, what do I need to deal with right now? What's kind of the problem in, in front of me today? Um, that may not have been the best approach because I do think that it's usually beneficial to have a vision. Uh, if you don't have a vision, then you might not like where you end up um, and you don't exactly have any guiding principles to kind of get you where you want to go. Um, that said, I mean, Ninja Reach was, you know, it was not uh, like a super fast growing startup or anything like that. We didn't take funding. Uh, nobody offered us funding, by the way. So it wasn't <laughs> like we turned down a bunch. I don't want to make it sound like that. Like, no, yeah, no, nobody gave us any funding. We, we were bootstrapping it, um, you know, and it grew and, and it grew nicely, but it wasn't, you know, uh, like I was faced with a tremendous amount of, of, of growth that had to be managed all at once. Um, there were problems and it was coming at a pace that I could kind of take it one at a time. Nice. I think that's sort of the uh, the benefit of bootstrapping versus taking VC cash, isn't it? Really, because you're you're not answerable to anybody else. You haven't set expectations with valuations about when you're going to deliver X growth, and you know potentially when you're going to hit profitability and stuff like that. It's more just like, hey, this is this is my business. I'm answerable to myself, and we'll get there when we get there, if we get there. And as you say, so many businesses aren't destined for, for like hyper growth, you know, but there's a a limit on them. Absolutely. It was definitely a lifestyle business, um, in intention and I'm a lifestyle entrepreneur. And, you know, when you are bootstrapping, you can kind of set the pace a little bit more yourself. Mm -hmm. How have you, I'm just quite curious now that you seem obviously that you've been traveling quite, quite a, a large proportion while you were building these things. How are you finding it? Um, working at the moment to build out shortlist and, and not having the freedom to travel? So nowadays, 
you know, the, the freedom to travel and in, in building the company are not necessarily, uh, you know, part of the same, part of the same intention. Uh, the, you know, the freedom to travel is sort of, Hey, I, I like to, I like to travel. <laughs> you know, I like to travel, I like to go places. Uh, I like to be in a different environment. Um, and sort of, you know, I would be almost building the company in spite of traveling it's, it's mm. to be honest, it's easier to run a, a business and to work when you're not traveling, right? Because you have more stability in your day to day, you're less likely having issues with something being delayed or, or Wi-Fi not being available or things like that. Um, so uh, not traveling is, is sort of, it's, it's easier to, to kind of be productive and do the work, um, but it's not nearly as fun mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's probably the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, productivity there. Is there anything these days that you you would have liked to have had in your life a few years ago that like principles or practices that you've implemented? I think that, you know, the, I guess the way I've been running shortlist is, is, is pretty similar to the approach that I've, I've taken um, with, with past businesses. Um, I, I think maybe I, it's just, maybe it's a little bit of a mindset thing. Um, so for example, early on in Ninja Outreach, I was kind of like neurotic about every little thing. Um, like for example, uh, customer support, uh, making sure that it was answered right away and stuff like that. And I, I do agree that a, a level of neuroticism, I guess a small level is kind of healthy because maybe that is what helped that business kind of grow and, and ultimately be successful. But it tends to be very stressful and, and not that fun. And maybe I wasn't the, <coughs> excuse me, the most pleasant person to be around all the time. Well, that was happening. Uh, so now with shortlist, I, I think I, I like to think I'm a little more relaxed in, in the way things are kind of done. Um, and so I think the mindset uh, is probably the biggest difference, not necessarily in the, the way that like that I have some particular approach to productivity or that like, oh, I wake up early in the morning now and I do X, Y, Z before anything else. It's not anything like that. Mm. I guess there's a, a difference between that neuroticism or... Um, I say like the difference between diligence and dictatorship, right? So making sure that you're on top of all the things that, that matter, but also having the trust in people that, and, and the trust in yourself that you've hired the right people to accomplish those goals um, and to meet the, the same kind of standards that you would have for it if you were doing it yourself as well. But what's your, um, I'm, I'm quite curious now, what, what's your goal for for shortlist? Is it to reach kind of a certain revenue or stability or a certain number of clients? You know, there are definitely revenue, uh, I hate to say goals, but uh, I guess for lack of a better word, there's some milestones that one, one would like to hit. Um, but I, I generally don't um, like to define like a goal of, of a business in terms of like a, such something, something so numerical. Um, for me, it's a little bit more of uh, I guess a vision, right? Like, and, and it's sort of, it's like a vision for the company and a vision for myself as someone in that company. And so, um, you know, certainly from my own perspective, um, you know, with shortlist, I, I wanted to be providing obviously, uh, a, what I believe to be a stable, sufficient income for myself and my family, um, that I can rely on. Um, I wanted to operate without, um, uh, complete oversight from myself. So I, I don't want to be maybe putting in 40 hours a week or so to run it. Um, I would like to be putting in maybe 20 hours or so a week to run it, something like that, something uh, less than, than full time. Um, and I would like to obviously, you know, I'd like to develop uh, a niche and a specialty with the business. So it, we've recently kind of decided to focus more on health and wellness businesses um, in the e-commerce space. Um, but we still have a lot to, I think, to, to learn and to, to, you know, figure out in that space that we can kind of call ourselves like the agency for these people, uh, for these types of companies. Um, obviously, I want the employees to be, you know, happy with where they work and, and to feel that they have, you know, that they're well paid and that they're getting benefits and just generally that the culture is, is sound. So I think those are those are more in line with kind of uh, what I would like to to achieve um, in a really really big picture, I guess perhaps um, I would love it if shortlist was 
somewhat of an umbrella brand to other businesses uh, and companies and that we had some more products of our own, um, maybe software or maybe a course or something like that. That wasn't just uh, a service-based agency on behalf of clients. Um, so that's kind of like your, your five-year vision. Mm -hmm. In terms of employee benefits, how do you really go about setting those? Is that, I guess, do you do it on where the person is based or do you do it on what sort of role they occupy or, you know, how do you even go about thinking about something like that? It's tricky. I definitely do not have it all figured out. I'm sort of trying to figure it out as I go along, to be honest. Um, People live obviously in different countries, and so uh, benefits uh, mean different things depending on where you are. Uh, in the U.S., we think about like healthcare, for example, but then in Europe, uh, a lot of the healthcare is already kind of provided by the state, and so it's not really necessary. Uh, you know, the main benefits um, I think that you know people think about are vacation, obviously, um, maybe some sort of uh, leave for like. I, someone's like pregnant, for example, like a maternal leave, I think is, is what we call it. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, th those are some of the things that kind of are, are on my mind. Um, with vacation, it's it's always very tricky, again, because you have, you have people working like in different capacities. Um, so like, what do you do with somebody who's working for you like 60 hours a month or something like that? It's like, it's like not full time. Maybe it's like around half time. It's like, so does that person get vacation? Do they not? Like if they do, how do you calculate it? Because it's not the equivalent of like the other, what everyone else is sort of working and how do they earn it? But they're also not like nobody. I mean, they're working for you like 60 plus hours a month or whatever it is. Uh, you have to address that somehow. And, it's, and it doesn't seem right that you know somebody who's been on the team for a year or more and everybody knows and everybody works with and you think of as a team member doesn't get benefits as the other person. I, I find it very tricky, to be honest. So I think, you know, those are some of the things I'm trying to kind of uh, <laughs> trying to sort of figure out. I mean, it's, it's in some cases, it's obvious, right, with like, you have somebody who's been there for a while, they're very senior, they're working full time. Okay. We want to introduce vacation. I think it's the, the fringe cases that that's quite difficult. Um, another thing is uh, like profit sharing and stuff. I've always wanted to do that with a company that I had, which is to kind of like take um, some share of the profit that the company earns and then allocate it to the employees. Um, and because I think that. Uh, I want people to feel incentivized with where they work. I want them to feel that like that the growth of the company is something that is going towards them as well. And they have a reason to kind of want to see the company grow. Otherwise it's like, why is everybody, you know, working on this? Um, but again, it's, it introduces you to the same, same questions is that you have these employees and with different, I hate to say statuses, but they have different relationships with the company. Um, and it becomes difficult to kind of, uh, equitably, fairly, uh, distribute, uh, you know, the means. So I think, you know, we're, we're kind of working through that. I have, I have ideas, but still figure it out. Mm. I, I like the differentiation between the, the kind of the standard cases and those edge cases where if we're all going to be honest, it kind of just boils down to a judgment call. Um, and I think a, lo a lot of the time for me, the easiest way is to just put yourself in their shoes for a little bit and say, if, if somebody kind of came to me with this proposal, would I think it was fair? Like, would, would I be really pissed off if somebody had, had come like this? Would I, would I feel like somebody's taking the mick a little bit if they, if they, you know? And I think that gets you some of the way. Um, I'm just curious though, do you have any feedback loops in place to, to find out whether the employees think think that that's fair or is it just kind of on quite like a casual basis having discussions with them one-to-one -one? so we do have feedback loops um although we could be doing better um we have uh so i have sort of haphazardly done like employee surveys and things like that um, probably maybe twice or so this year um in the sort of a general kind of survey to talk about, you know, how they view the company and, and its progress and, and the team and, and things like that. Um, but I haven't done that in a number of months. Uh, I did it like maybe twice somewhere earlier in the year and that's why it feels like it's been a little while. So that's, that's kind of one thing. Um, we also do a state of the business uh, meeting every month 
um, where we kind of talk about what's kind of going on with the company and, and what, you know, what happened recently that was notable. Um, and what I am going to start putting in that, because I haven't, I, at the end of the presentation, I used to always be like, okay, does anyone have any questions? And like, nobody ever has any questions. Uh, and I was like, well, is it that nobody has any questions or, or is it that there are no questions that people want to ask in front of everybody else? Because I was like, if I had a question like, hey, how are we going to do races this year? Would mm -hmm. I want to ask that in front of 20 other people? <laughs> like honestly, the business was like, yeah, probably not. So what, so what I want to do now is have an anonymized uh, feedback or question uh, portion of the state of the business where prior to the meeting, we open it up to the team and they can anonymously uh, submit questions and feedback. And then we will go through those on the call. And I'm hoping that maybe that leads to a little bit better participation. So yes, there are like some, some feedback loops and I definitely talk with people kind of one-on-one, -on -one, um, but uh, you know, again, not a perfect system. Mm. I wondered if there are any like short term markers or KPIs or metrics that would have been helpful for you to look at that would have acted almost as something to keep you on track. So like, okay, we haven't hit this. I don't know whether that it's your revenue goal or, or number of clients or whatever. We haven't hit that, but in terms of what we are doing, this, this, and this looks like it's going in the right direction. Yeah. I think that with the tool, you know, aside from revenue, which is the, obviously the easiest metric to look at and kind of, claim success, um, you really want to be looking at like the customer success, um, which is, you know, how many people are using this project product and, and loving it? And what are the types of things, uh, projects that they're getting done by using the tool and, and those types of things and obviously retention kind of factors into that and, and things of like that. Um, unfortunately, those things are extremely hard to measure. Uh, they're hard to measure. They're hard to kind of, uh, they're, they're hard to get a hold of. You know, it's not like just every customer is kind of waiting by the phone saying, hey, when's Dave going to call me so I can tell him about like this cool thing I did with the tool? It's not like that at all. Um, it's sort of like occasionally somebody feels really compelled to tell you something, but for the most part, they're kind of like are going about their business mm -hmm. and they like the tool and they enjoy it, but it doesn't mean that they are just kind of ready to give a lot of feedback. So, you know, that's why, you know, things like revenue are kind of easy to get and look at, um, you know, looking at the team um, and the team satisfaction and knowing that people were happy with where they were and stuff like that was also another indicator that we were doing the right things. Um, uh, we looked at a million metrics, obviously, you know, and like traffic and stuff like that. Um, but it's sort of questionable. Yeah. Like how much those are really correlating with like growth. Hmm. No, I always find like the measurements that are easy, easiest to measure are the ones that get measured. Um, and like revenue is super easy to, to look at. Whereas something like you mentioned retention and churn, they're a little bit harder to, you can obviously do things like cohort analysis to understand who came in when and whether they're still with you and the percentage of people that came in through different marketing campaigns and things like that. But that stuff is complicated. You know, it's quite hard to do and uh, occasionally it involves somebody who's actually pretty solid at data analysis to be able to do that. So as a, as a CEO or a founder, you've obviously got to have the dedication and the willingness to uncover those numbers, to, to spend kind of the, the resources to, to want to understand those and understand the value that they'll, they'll bring to you. Otherwise you just won't, you won't bother, right? You'll just stick to the obvious things that you can see. Um, so I think a large part of that is people understanding the value, what it can, like these metrics that aren't just there on the surface, what they can tell you about the business and what you're doing well and what you're, what you're, what you're not really. Uh, so that's, that's super interesting. It is very tricky. I think that, um, yeah, like you mentioned, like a cohort analysis and things like that. And there were tools that, um, like for example, profit well, will kind of, show you your cohort analysis they'll do the calculations for you but you know what does it really mean for one month to be three percent better or worse than another month and and what's the reason for that is it because you did something or you didn't do something or just that group of customers or it's just one big customer left or there's so many kind of i think that often the data leads to more questions than answers <laughs> sure this is this is something that i had a, a conversation with somebody years about uh, years ago about because they were asking me about Google Analytics at the time. Um, and I was telling them 
basically the, the crux of it was never go into Google Analytics unless you have a specific question and something that you're going to do with the, with the results. You know, that's got to have like an impact because otherwise what you do is open up GA and spend like an hour digging through data and you're literally no wiser by the end of this. And I, I spent uh, four years or so working for an agency and we would have clients that would every month, they would ask us for a report on, on how their website was performing, how their marketing campaigns were performing. We also included at the end our recommendations based on that. And not once were those recommendations followed. So why are you even paying somebody to compile this, this data for you if you're not going to do anything? And the same kind of applies on, on uh, like with your own business, right? Why are you tracking these metrics if you're not going to do something about those metrics? You know, if you're not going to use them to inform your future actions, you might as well you know, spend your, spend your time elsewhere. What do you think about that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we, we just spend too much time tracking analytics. Um, I very rarely look at the analytics for shortlist, to be honest. I mean, like Google analytics for, for example, because it's nothing, for, there's nothing I need to know right now from that. It's not going to really tell me anything that I don't already kind of know about my business. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we should all, yeah, obsess a little less. I know a lot of people, boy, they look at the analytics, like, daily or weekly and like, Oh, why is it down today? Or why is it down over last week? And it's like, uh, just cause it's like natural volatility. Um, and you just really need to, yeah, kind of avoid, uh, getting too caught up. I, I don't, the, I, the, the most I'll ever look at anything is monthly. Just that's it. That's it. Sure. Yeah. That's sim- similar to me. Every, every month, what I do is just write up what happened in the previous month, the actions that I took and the results that it had. Um, both in a data, but also from from a personal level, like how achieving certain goals made me feel and whether that's changed the goals that I want to achieve for the next month or the next year as well. I feel like things like that are almost like quite akin to journaling in terms of understanding where you are like uh, objectively in terms of objective metrics that you can measure, but also those subjective metrics that just basically live inside of you like how do i feel about that is there anything like that that you kind of incorporate into your your practice or i'm not as good with the subjective stuff although i think that um i have thought about that that would be a good idea of like uh what's my happiness every day or something like that um because sometimes you know you wonder yeah like uh about the the changes and sort of how you're feeling kind of day to day week to week and, and things like that and uh, but, but no, to answer your question, no, I don't, I don't have anything like that at the moment. Perfect. No, it's, um, it's, it's been kind of a, a journey for me because, um, even as recently, maybe as like six weeks ago or so, I kind of started incorporating yoga and reading in the morning. So like the first two hours of my day are, are always mine. Um, even when I work with clients in Australia who tend to expect things done because of where I am in the UK, kind of in my morning, I don't start until, until 9am ever. Um, so between seven and nine, all I do is kind of read and do yoga, um, and then get myself kind of ready for the day. And I think that has had a really large impact. I started to do journaling and just felt that I couldn't keep with it. Um, I tried to do it for a little while and then I was just getting really bored with the process. And I just couldn't stick with it. And I think that's like a large part of it. And I could have, you know, beaten myself up about not sticking with it. Um, You know, maybe I'll go back to it in the future. Maybe I won't. But I think the important thing for people is to find what what makes them happy, what moves the needle in terms of um, their own kind of productivity and happiness. And maybe journaling just isn't it for me, which is surprising considering I'm a writer, but you know, maybe, maybe I'm writing so much for other people that I don't particularly want to write my own things. And and when I do, I want it to be work related, not personal. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that you have to, you have to find what works for you. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of talk out there about doing yeah, meditation and yoga and journaling and, uh, gratitude exercises and things like that. And they are all great. They are proven to work for many people, but they do not, I don't think they do not work for everybody. Um, and I don't think you should force something just because you, you think it's what you're supposed to be doing. 
No, definitely, definitely. So what's, uh, what's kind of next for you on a, a personal level, do you think? On a personal level, um, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm probably more focused on shortlist now than, than, than ever. Um, and I think that uh, we're having a good quarter uh, after stuff with pandemic and COVID and, and sort of just normal um, uh, yeah, I- issues around that. And we had also maybe gotten a little away from ourselves and sort of introducing um, other, a lot of other projects and stuff, not client work, but sort of like, like business projects and things like that, um, that we probably weren't ready for, to be honest. And I felt, anyway, I thought we were spreading ourselves too thin. Mm. It's basically what I, what I'm trying to say and that we were probably spending too much money. Um, and that was reflecting in, in profitability and stuff like that. And so I kind of roped all that in and now things are looking good again. And I want to kind of continue on that path for a while until I feel like really, really strong and stable about where we are. Um, and we have a new vision, which is good, but we're taking steps very slowly on like, you know, really transitioning there. Um, and so this, you know, it's just mostly business, uh, related, uh, you mentioned personal, um, other than that, well, I mean, I had a daughter four months ago. That's a big oh, one. Fantastic. Congratulations. Um, yeah. It's, it's been great. Um, so, you know, and we've come up with a good approach to, you know, uh, caretaking and, and, and work and managing both. Um, and just, yeah, learning, watching her grow has been great. So, yeah. Fantastic. One of the things I wanted to get back to, it's a little bit out of order now, but it's been kind of sat in the back of my mind is you mentioned that you were moving towards uh, e-commerce for for shortlists with health and wellness specifically. So is there anything that appeals to you in particular about that niche? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that, you know, the the reason, I mean, the number one reason why we we chose that niche is because it's, it's something from a mission perspective that that we feel like we can get behind. Uh, it's a young company; people are focused on on being healthy, and we want also to be working with clients who we feel are trying to make the world like a better place and more healthy and wellness. Um, and we just don't; um, it's just not our place to to be working so much in you know maybe like finance or crypto or, or different things like that. Although exceptions will still be made as we make the transition, but uh, at least to have a, a vision and a focus. Um, so I think that from a personal standpoint, a mission standpoint, it motivates us as a company. Um, I also feel like from a business perspective, it's, it's trending in the right direction. So I think that um, e-commerce, obviously more people buying things online than ever before, especially nowadays with so many retail stores being closed and people not kind of going out. Um, and health and wellness is a huge trend in the US. And I think it's taken over in, in Europe and other places as well. People shopping organic, they're, they're caring more about where their products are sourced and what's in them. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, overall, just everything about it. I, you know, I really like. Mm. Well, a- anecdotally, I can kind of give some minor evidence to, to support that as well, just in terms of, I've seen an uplift in, in clients approach me who are based in kind of sustainable living. Um, so, you know, just in the recent months I've worked with um, somebody who, who does zero plastic cosmetics, um, like, uh, bathware and that sort of thing. Um, and then somebody else who does sustainability, like eco clothing. Um, so that's kind of around like no synthetic dyes All workers are, are paid a fair wage. Um, and, you know, uh, less, uh, less kind of packaging used than, than kind of their traditional counterparts, that sort of thing. I think that's going to go to improve, like not just because it's what we want, but there's more transparency expected these days in terms of, I want to be able to see where this company is getting their ingredients from, you know, if it's something like, um, food, for example, or, um, or kind of that, um, uh, bath, bath kind of example that I gave, it's like, oh, okay. Are you using, um, like non-recyclable plastic? Are you using palm oil and things like that, that we think are actually going to be really dam- well, are damaging to the environment and do have a substantial cost. Um, so it's like that transparency, that expectation. So I'm, I'm definitely kind of with you there from a personal point of view. It also makes me feel better, like from, from a business point of view that, okay, I think that's like a noble goal and it does make me smile a bit more, which I think is like as good a metric as any when you're kind of choosing which clients to work with. Like, do they make me smile? Yes, no, great. Um, 
And I've seen that, and I, I'm not sure if other people in my, I, I'm, I guess I'm in quite a fortunate position myself that I can turn down clients that don't fit that, that industry. And hopefully that's something that other people will be able to kind of take a stand on as well. You know, if somebody makes you feel icky, I think icky is probably like the, the technical term. Um, if somebody makes you feel bad in terms of the industry, then if you can afford not to, then you shouldn't touch it. Um, so like for me, I, I don't work with like tobacco companies. I don't work with alcohol companies. I don't work with gambling companies. Now, don't get me wrong. Like I, I don't smoke, but I drink and I play poker. So I've got no problem with those on a personal level. I just don't feel like I want to be encouraging other people to do those, to do those things with my marketing. Does that kind of resonate with you at all? Yeah, absolutely. I think we all want to feel that like the business we're working in is, is kind of on the right side of uh, history, so to speak. Uh, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to have some vices and stuff like that um, in moderation. And I think in most of, most of those cases, it's totally fine too. Um, so yeah, I think that's, a, that's a, exactly where we're coming from as well. Fantastic. Well, Dave, thank you so much for, for talking to us today. Really appreciate it. I wish you all the best for, uh, for Shortlist. So if people do want to find out more about you and Shortlist and kind of get, get to grips with, uh, with the agency, where can they go? They should go to shortlist.io. Uh, and then That's you can nice shoot me an email. <laughs> yeah, they, my email is dave at shortlist.io if anyone wants to get in touch. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Dave. And I hope all the listeners have found this valuable. Thanks so much, Nelson. And that's it for today. You've been listening to the Working From Home podcast with me, Nelson Jordan. We've been talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly side of remote work. Thanks so much for listening. And I really hope you've enjoyed the time you spent with us today. If you'd like to discuss the podcast, you want to make a new friend, or you're interested in working with me on a copywriting or digital marketing project, then visit nelson-jordan.com. That's nelson-jordan.com, where you can also sign up to my newsletter to hear about this podcast and other exciting projects. Until next week, goodbye.